We're going to start a new book tonight, the oldest book in the Bible, the book of Job, an incredible book, widely misunderstood. Victor Hugo, the famous author, has called it the greatest masterpiece of the human mind. That's quite a statement by, by a, a very professional guy. Its style is very unique. It's actually an epic poem. Uh, it's probably comparable in a sense, like the Iliad or the Odyssey, what have you. Its style is such that it may have been originally, long, long ago, presented as a drama, because most of it is in poetry framed by some prose. The prose is almost like program notes. You know, if you go to an opera or something like that, you often have notes that come up in front or sometimes behind it to explain it. It's, it's, it's very similar to that. But despite its very elevated and elaborate style, uh, it's a, um, all about a real person. Job was not just a figure of literature or of some kind. He is a, a very real person. He's mentioned by Ezekiel along in the same phrase, if you will, with Noah and Daniel. So just as Noah was real and Daniel, of course, was real, uh, so was Job. He's also mentioned by James in the New Testament. In fact, we'll make reference to that here shortly. The vocabulary, there's much discussion among experts about Job's, about the translation, because it's a very, very um, uh, elegantly written uh, piece, although very, very early. It's the, as I say, the earliest book in the Bible. There's over 110 words that are not found anywhere else. Uh, in the Old Testament. That's a larger number of what they call the hapax uh, legoma, um, uh, legomena, the, the words that are not used anywhere else. It's the largest number than any other Old Testament book. The vocabulary is very elegant. For example, there's five different words for lions. There's six different words for traps, six different words for darkness, and so forth. We'll find in it all kinds of things. Names of constellations. In fact, we'll discover some things about the constellations that you probably don't know, even if you were an astronomer. We'll come to that when we get there. It has names of metals, precious stones. He clearly was familiar with the anatomy of these giant beasts. It includes the technical language of law courts, a technical language from the occupations of mining and hunting, it has reference of, references to insects, reptiles, birds, beasts, weapons, military strategies, musical instruments, means of travel, Geography, whirlwinds, dew, dawn, darkness, clouds, rain, all of these things are quite rich in their expression. It also has a surprising richness of both similes and metaphors. As an example, the brevity of life is depicted by a weaver's shuttle one place, one's breath in another place, a cloud, a shadow, a runner, a falcon, a flower. The, the language is very, very elegant, very sophisticated. And uh, we'll discover that Job was probably one of the richest, most powerful men of his time. Now, along with this poetic parallelism, which you'll find all through it, where, that's where you have two lines where the second line completes or con contrasts with the first, very typical pattern in Hebrew poetry. It also has strophes, which are groups of verses that uh, have a rhythmic pattern all through the thing. So much so that Tennyson, the famous poet, called this the greatest poem of both ancient and modern times. Now, we'll miss all that because we're obviously going to confine our concerns with just the translation. But for those that uh, are expert in the language, it's a very, very elegant, uh, uniquely structured document. We speak of the names of God, but in the book of Job, we will find Elohim, El, Eloah, Adonai, Yehovah, or Yehovah or Yahweh, however you wish, and Shaddai. Elohim is God the creator, in other words, carrying out God's will. El, the name of God, is uh, God the omnipotent, carrying out his work. Aloha is God that's worshipped, uh, the living God that's in contrast to idols and such. There's the word Adonai, which is God the ruler and uh, of the earth. In fact, the whole earth, not just his chosen people. And uh, Yehovah, or Yehovah, or however you choose to pronounce it, God the eternal one. Who he who is, who was, and always will be, or, or is to come. The self-existent God who stands in a covenant relationship with his own people. 
And then Shaddai, which actually means breath, but means God the all-bountiful. Some people say God the Almighty, but it's really not merely Almighty as regards power, but all-bountiful as regards his resources. In fact, the term actually, as I say, is the Hebrew, uh, uh, led to the Hebrew word for breast. The languages are mostly Hebrew, but also Akkadian, Arabic, Aramaic, Sumerian, Ugaritic, and there's many other, many, it's an amalgam of many ancient languages, which makes the, the translations a special challenge. But if you get into that, and I'll just use one example that I think is fascinating, you find Hebrew idioms. The trick in this is to translate Hebrew idioms into our idioms, not literally. Sometimes a literal translation causes you to miss it unless you know the idioms. Idioms are the key thing. One of the Hebrew idioms is a verb for accept. It's the word dashin, which technically means turn to ashes. To accept a sacrifice, God turned it to ashes. And it gives us a clue as to how Abel knew that his, remember in the story of Cain and Abel in Genesis 4, that uh, Abel knew that his offering was accepted. How? Scholars believe, because there are several references to this, that in those days God actually accepted it with fire from heaven. That's how Cain knew his wasn't. And that's why they had the, you know, the, 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 the animosity and so forth. In fact, we even find that this having respect to Abel's offering uh, uh, is how he obtained a witness that he was righteous, as he, the book of Hebrews, the New Testament confirms. We do have a book here that's by a single author. It's not an amalgam by editors. It's a single author from the interdependence of the design. And then the big speculation comes, when was this book written? We're not sure. There's a tremendous range of guesses by, author, by uh, scholars. Um, there's a lot of evidence to indicate that the book was during the time of the patriarchs, maybe as old as Abraham himself. There's no mention of the law or Israel and so forth, yet there are sacrifices. That's interesting. The idea of sacrifices preceded the law of, of Moses and so on. There's no mention of other gods. It's interesting. This ancient book takes for granted one god. There isn't an issue of, of, of false gods and so forth. Now, there's, there's a, a lot of clues as to when it was. One is the length of Job's life. He was probably about 60 when all these things started to happen because his children are grown. And yet he, grows, he, he lives 140 years after the events of this book. And so that would imply he's got several hundred years, which is about compares very favorably with Abraham's father, Terah, who lived to be at 205. Abra by, you know, as you look at those patriarchs, they get, they, their longevities get shorter. Terah was 205. Abraham was 175, Isaac 180, Jacob 147, Joseph 110. They got shorter since. So that age implies, uh, in the absence of other evidence, that he's probably, it precedes Abraham, maybe in, in uh, Terah's father. So, I mean, Abraham's father. Uh, he may have overlapped Noah, which is 350 years before the flood, uh, or Shem, 502 years. Abraham may have been born only 292 years after the flood. Now, these things overlap. It's very interesting sometimes when you study your Bibles, take those ages, you know, when they're, the relate to, and to see how how fascinating those long lives also cause some interesting overlaps, and it's worth the, gives a whole different perspective to look into that. We'll notice that in the book, wealth is measured by livestock, and uh, not by the number of Mercedes in the garage or something like that. Um, so this is very typical of the idioms in the days of Abraham and Jacob and so forth. We hear about two tribes, the Sabians and the Chaldeans, are nomads in the time of Job, they were not in later years. So that's also another clue of its antiquity, very early. Job was priest of his family. So a national priest, priesthood was not in existence yet. And uh, there's a Hebrew word twice. It says, uh, it says a piece of money. That Hebrew idiom is only used twice, and both elsewhere in the Bible, only of Job, of J in the days of Jacob. And uh, musical instruments, the timbrel, the harp, the lyre, the, or the, the flute, are also mentioned in Genesis uh, uh, as early as Genesis 4, also in Genesis 31. Job's daughters were heirs to the estate, which means this was not after Moses. It was earlier. And there's similar, there are also similar literary works they've discovered in Mesopotamia about the same time. Uh, there's no reference to any of the Mosaic institutions. There's no priesthood, laws, tabernacles, special religious days, any of that. So it obviously predates all of that. And the, uh, the name Shaddai, which we, we typically translate God the Almighty, is used 31 times in the book of Job, uh, 17 times elsewhere in the New Testament all put together. It's a very prominent name there. And uh, now the other clue is the personal and place names that are associated 
uh, with the book of Job are also associated with the age of the patriarchs, J Abraham and so forth. And I could go through these and bore you to death, but basically um, Sheba is, uh, which means oath or uh, sometimes also can mean seven. Uh, it was a kingdom in Arabia, among other things. And uh, the Sabians from Sheba are mentioned in Genesis 25 and elsewhere many times in Job. Uh, Sheba, in fact, was uh, uh, in southern Arabia. And uh, the Sabians of classical geography carried on trade with the spices uh, uh, with people all over the uh, ancient world. Uh, they were Semites uh, speaking some particular dialects of South, Ar uh, South Arabia. And uh, it later becomes a monarchy in the days of Queen of Sheba that visits Solomon and all of that. Uh, we'll hear a lot about Tema, which is, means technically means south or desert. Um, it's a, uh, uh, a place that uh, is about 250 miles southeast of Edom on, on the route between Damascus and Mecca and uh, in the northern part of the Arabian Peninsula. We'll constantly find these place names and things all seem to associate with Arabia, especially Northern Arabia, especially Northeast Arabia, Edom and that area. So somehow that's the domain of all of this. Um, one of the key players, one of the first of the three key uh, so-called friends of, of uh, Job, Eliphaz, uh, is, uh, uh, he's one of the guys that visited Job in his affliction. He was a Temanite, that is a native of Teman in Idumea or Edom. Um, he's the first that enters into a debate with Job. Much of the bulk of the book are these debates, and we're, we won't go through all that in excessive detail, but uh, that's, the, that's the core of the book. Um, Eliphaz's language is uh, more delicate and gentle than his other buddies, but he still imputes to Job, tries to say Job's all his problems are because of his sin and so forth. And... Uh, we could go on. Now, Job itself is a very common name in, in, in about 2000 BC in that region. Um, so it's hard to pin anything else down. Um, so much for that. The uh, first part of the book that we're going to touch on tonight will be like an introduction. Gives us an awareness of a conversation that Job didn't know about. As we study the book of Job, you need to realize the insight that we'll get right up front is one that Job didn't have. We're going to be treated to this dialogue between God and Satan, where the whole thing is sort of a contest is proposed. Job didn't know that. And as you study this, we need to, uh, the book, let's, let's try to keep that in mind. We have this strange sort of challenge. And uh, by the way, it's God that challenges Satan, not the other way around. We'll, we'll, we'll highlight that in a minute. Then the bulk of the book is uh, Job's three friends. During all these troubles, he has these three friends that, quote, comfort him, close quote. As we often joke, if you have friends like that, you don't need enemies. Because they're all uh, being his friends, they're trying to explain that all his problems are because of his sin or this, that, and the other thing. And, 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 and finally, at the end of things, uh, God himself answers for Job and puts those guys where, where they belong. But there's a fourth guy that everybody overlooks. A very mysterious guy. We'll talk about that, Elihu. He's a fourth friend that also comments God does not rebuke him. There's a great mystery as to what that's really all about, and we'll deal with, that, deal with that when we get there. But then at the end, when God answers for Job, is one of the most precious passages in the Bible. There's a science quiz given to Job and his friends by God himself, and tucked away in that science quiz are all kinds of discoveries. It's actually, there is more... Uh, on the creation of the world in Job than in the book of Genesis. So those of you, those I should say those of us that have sort of a technical bent, will discover in every nook and cranny all kinds of interesting surprises. There are dinosaurs, both aquatic and land dinosaurs, in the book of Job. Because where are the dinosaurs of the Bible? They're there in the book of Job. And of course, uh, Satan's challenge goes defeated because Job does pretty well. <laughs> now, where there is so much misinformation, and I won't ask you to write, if we were a class, I'd ask you to take a piece of paper and write down before we start what you think the main message in Job is. And I'd be willing to predict that more than nine out of 10 will be wrong. Job is why do the innocent suffer? That's the common cliche you see in commentaries or Bible handbooks. Job's all about why do the innocent suffer? Well, if that's the problem, it never gets answered. That's not what Job is about, really. Job is about the oldest lesson in the world. 
Job is about the most important lesson that is possible for us to learn. And if we don't know this lesson, it doesn't matter what else we know. And our knowledge might be vast, maybe very deep on a number of subjects, but it will not carry us beyond the grave, and this lesson will. It's a lesson I can't teach you. How shall mortal man be justified before God? Even Socrates displays his brilliance by raising the question. He, Socrates in 500 BC said, It may be that deity can forgive sins, but I don't see how. That expression of frustration shows great insight on Socrates because he recognized that a holy God has a problem forgiving sin because sin needs to be paid for. So this lesson that we're going to be experiencing in Job is a lesson that only God himself can teach. In James, we have a reference to Job. James was the Lord's brother that wrote the book in the Bible. It's very late in the New Testament, the last couple of, verses, chapters, a couple of books before the end. James uses the strange expression, the end of the Lord. In other words, the final lesson, the final key, if you will, the end of the Lord. He says, Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord. The Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. So the patience of Job is only a piece of the puzzle. We're going to discover this guy, Job, endured some astonishing things and acquitted himself surprisingly well. But be careful what the point of it is. If you believe that the point of this is the patience of Job, you're setting yourself up for a failure because you're setting yourself up for just another reason to have confidence in the flesh or oneself rather than to really gather the message that the book of Job really carries. And uh, what is that message? You remember, it's the message that started in the Garden of Eden where God asks the question of Adam and Eve, where art thou? And the answer, of course, in effect, it's implied, is lost. That's where we all are. And that's where Job was, even with his patience, even with his endurance and so forth. A couple of questions. What did the mighty famine have to do in Luke 15 to the son? What did it teach him? The, the prodigal son. There was a famine, he was in the far land. What did it teach him? It, teached him? it brought him to the point where he could say to himself and ultimately to his father, I have sinned. There was another famine for Joseph's brethren, you may recall, in Genesis 44, where ultimately they go to Egypt and they acknowledge before Pharaoh, we are verily guilty. What did Nathan's parable to David, remember when Nathan went to David over Bathsheba and all that, um, what did that parable do for David? It caused David to confess, I have sinned against the Lord. When we get to the book of Isaiah, it starts right off in the, chapter 6 of, of, of Isaiah, where Isaiah sees, a, 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 sees the throne of God. And what's his response? I am, in chapter 6, first five verses, I am undone. I am unclean. It's interesting, every place in the Bible where, where one is confronted with God, his response isn't joy, it's terror in terms of realizing the gap between ourselves and a holy God. You say, well, gee, I'm not so bad. Maybe not, but compared to a holy God, you got big problems. It's not so much how evil you are, that's bad enough. It's how holy God is. Daniel, the same thing. Uh, in Daniel 10, he gets uh, confronted and he says, my comeliness has turned to corruption. He's, he's crushed. Remember what the miracle did for Peter in the New Testament in Luke 5. Jesus did a miracle, and Peter fell and said, Depart from me, O Lord, I'm a sinful man. He, it confronted him with the reality of who he was. So if all we gather from this book is the patience of Job, which is the cliche, very common cliche, it'll only provide additional grounds for self-confidence and thus our own ultimate disappointment and depression because we each will fail to even be as good as Job did. So that's not the point of the book. Why do the innocent suffer? That's the usual cliche, and I'm always amused because that, that issue won't really be answered, in a sense. You will not, when you finish Job, you won't really know why innocent suffer. In this case, they suffered because Satan had a challenge. 
If Job overheard that, he said, you can't you challenge somebody else, please, you know. It reminds you of Tigvi in the famous musical, Fiddler on the Roof. But praise the God, couldn't you just for a while choose somebody else, you know. There's a deeper level, too, and we're going to understand the relationship between Satan and God, widely misunderstood. You'll notice as we get into this, they're not equals. This isn't dualism as underlies the concepts behind the Star Wars, you know, the dualism. There's good for you know, there's dark side, good side, and that they're somehow in conflict. Nonsense. The good side uh, is in control. And uh, it's not dualism. They're not equal. Satan is subject to God all the way through. All the forces in this narrative are under God's control. There are no surprises to God. More than any other book in the Bible, we're going to be confronted with glimpses of the true greatness and majesty of God. So prepared, it's going to be a fun trip. Let's just jump right into Job chapter 1. You thought I could prattle for a full hour as an introduction, but I, <laughs> I've got to surprise you. Job chapter 1, verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz, not Oz, Uz, whose name was Job. That man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. Now, uh, Uz, there's a number of Uzes in the scripture, son of Shem, son of Noah. Uh, there was a land of king, it was the land of kings in Jeremiah's day, in Jeremiah 25. But also, Uz was also a neighbor of Edom. And uh, you know, some scholars believe that Uz was a, in, in the Bashan area, the Golan Heights area, uh, south of Damascus. Others that it was Edom southeast of the Dead Sea. Others, and I think this is the way I lean for a lot of reasons, uh, they believe it was east of Edom in northern Arabia. This, most of this, I believe, happened in northern Arabia. And uh, this last view is supported by the fact that Job lived in the desert region, He's, yet the land was fertile for livestock and agriculture. The customs, vocabulary, and the geography all relate to northern Arabia so much so that that, to me, is the, the, the scholastically most justifiable conjecture as to actual location. Job was apparently one of the most prominent citizens in whatever region that is, and that's really what we're getting to. It says he was perfect. The word is Tom, which means upright, sincere, without guile. He was blameless, not sinless. I'm not saying he was sinless, but he was blameless and he knew how to deal with his sin. He knew how to handle his sin. He does sacrifices and so forth. But we do see portrayed for us a complete, well-balanced man that feared God. And uh, that, in fact, if you don't yield to that point, if you don't really understand that Job was blameless, you'll miss the point of most of the discussion. As his friends try to probe and pin all his troubles on his shortcomings. Verse 2, we're getting, making progress. Let's see, we made one verse in 20 minutes. We, no, we'll be all right. Okay, verse 2. And there were born unto him seven sons, excuse me, yeah, seven sons and three daughters. His substance also was 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 she-asses, and a very great household, so that this man was, get this, the greatest of all the men of the East. Very prosperous guy. It's interesting that riches are not necessarily evil. Here's a good guy, one of the best in the land. He also happened to be the richest in the land, and uh, one of the richest. And uh, so that's a key point here. In verse 3, we have a list of the camels, the oxen, and so forth. That list is going to turn out to be very important for us. By the time we get to the end of the book, that list is going to reveal to you a surprise. A surprise that will prove, I believe, to be of great comfort. A comfort that most people miss that is probably one of the most important comforts that you may experience in your life. And we'll, I'll, I'll leave it there until we get to chapter 42 and get into all that, but be, re be ready for that. This closes with the phrase, the men of the east. That term, you know, he was usually associated with uh, the tribe of Kedar in northern portions of Arabia. It's uh, that area that you and I would know as Kuwait, incidentally. Not a big deal in passing. Verse 4, and his sons went and feasted in their houses every one his day and sent and called for the three sisters to eat and to drink with them. Now his sons, he has seven sons, what most Scholars infer what they mean here. They feasted on their birthday. Each one, each one of the sons had a special day, and they were having a feast. And and uh, each at a, each one had a unique time. And the three sisters went to eat and drink with them. Uh, we're going to discover fatherly concern. We're going to discover that Job was a family guy. Verse five, and it was so 
When the days of their feasting were gone about and Job sent and sanctified them, he rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. He's a man. Here's a, here's a guy who is a man of prayer. Very rich, very wealthy, very prosperous, a neat guy. But one of the focuses that we have on him, he's a man of prayer. In fact, one of his concerns is that his children may have inadvertently cursed God in their hearts. And uh, because of that, he, uh, he uh, offered special prayers for them. This, is, this idea of cursing God in your heart is going to emerge as one of the key themes in this book. And Job also, I think, recognized that your greatest spiritual challenge can be when things are going well. Often our greatest spiritual growth is when things are rough. You know, it's interesting, we, it's when things are really tough that we turn to God. Maybe that's why he brings toughness into our lives. It's the only time he hears from us. Why don't you call? <laughs> One of our biggest challenges can be when things are well, when prosperous and the market's up and you've got this promotion and everything's going great. Watch out. Watch out. That's when you can be tested uh, in the greatest uh, way possible. This speaks of a burnt offering. A burnt offering from our study in Leviticus, you may recall that burnt offering was the one that spoke of total dedication to God. And in effect, the, the, the uh, recognition of God's rightful ownership of men and women. So the burnt offering is mentioned here as a practice that he did. I think the burnt offering is not just a, is not a mosaic offering. It, was a, it, I believe, was the offering in Eden from the beginning. But we'll move on here. And so here's Job, a godly man, a landowner, and a good father. In fact, everything that you can sort of explore about Job, you'll discover he's Got a great, he's got straight A's in his report card. He's a good guy. That's the point. That, that's the premise that underlies the whole book. And it's very important to understand that right up front. So as the first five verses sets us up. We know who he was, where he lived, what he had. He's wealthy. Everything is looked all peachy keen. And then we get to verse 6, which opens up the dark side, in a sense. It says, now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. Now here we have a very key technical term, a term that is used consistently throughout the Old Testament to refer to angels. The Bene Ha'elohim, which means the sons of God. What it, that term implies is a direct creation of God. A direct creation of God. And therefore, that term is used uh, quite broadly of angels. We got a scene shift that occurred here in verse 6. We've shifted from the earth with its camels and wealth and whatever into heaven. This is a scene shift that probably is dra uh, uh, dramatized by Elisha's servant. You may recall in 2 Kings 6 when uh, Elisha and his servant are surrounded by the Syrian army. And uh, they're all out there. And the servant gets up in the morning and sees them, realizes they're surrounded. He's frightened. He's terrified. These are the enemy. He goes to Elisha and says, Elisha, we're surrounded. Elisha says, relax. Those that are with us are more than they were them. The servant says, in effect, wait, I can hear them revving their engines. They're there. They're real. And Elisha, almost out of exasperation, turns to the Lord and says, Lord, open his eyes so he can really see. And the servant looks out and he sees that they surrounded, they themselves were surrounded with chariots of fire. Elisha, Elisha's servant was given this glimpse into this other dimensionality that Elisha, of course, understood that they were well protected. We see a similar kind of glimpse into the spiritual reality in Daniel chapter 10, where Daniel is fasting and praying and for 21 days and this, this messenger comes and explains that he'd been sent when he started fasting 21 days ago he was sent but it took him 21 days to fight his way through this demon demonic world to get through and and uh, the prince of the power of persia was against him until michael came to help him and, and he's come through when i give you my I give you the next two chapters of prophecy chapters 11 and 12 of daniel i got to go back and fight him and then also the prince of 
Greece shortly. Greece, Greece came after 200 years after Persia. But he's not talking about the kings. He's talking about the spirit powers behind those empires. And, and of course, in Revelation 4, we get another glimpse like that when John is caught up there. So we have this. We're moving into this strange reality. Si uh, uh, Nachmanides, the ancient Hebrew um, sage in the 12th century, in his commentary on Genesis, concluded from the text of Genesis 1 that the universe has 10 dimensions. But only four are knowable by ourselves, and six are not knowable. And that's very curious because today particle physicists, with their billion dollar atomic accelerators, have determined that we live in 10 dimensions. Not, not the three that were spatial dimensions we're familiar with, length and height. There's a fourth called time. Those four dimensions we can measure. The other six, we know are there by a number of ways, but we can't measure the curl in less than 10 to the minus 35 centimeters, so we can only infer them by indirect means. I find that fascinating because they've discovered, finally, today, what Nachmanides learned by studying the text carefully. But it's interesting, too, because I suspect, this is just a conjecture, but I throw it out for your con consideration. I think the original universe prior to Genesis 3 was a 10-dimensional universe, and the result of Adam's sin was to split that the four that we're left with are the four that we experience. The other six are hidden from us. And we call those the spiritual realm. I think much of these things are hyperdimensional, more so than the dimensions. That's all a possibility. We could uh, spend a lot of time on that. But the main point is the direct creations of God are angels and also Adam. Luke, in his genealogy, when he gets to Adam, says Adam was a son of God. He was a, Adam was a direct creation of God. You and I are not direct creations of God. We're sons of Adam, not sons of God in the natural. How do we come? Direct creations of God. In John, this is very, it's, the Holy Spirit designed this whole book, 66 books by 40 different guys over thousands of years, but it's one book by the, it's, uh, with its origin outside our, our, uh, our spaces, our hyperspaces. Um, in John chapter 1, Speaking of Jesus, it says, He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become what? The sons of God. <coughs> you see, you and I are the subject of a new creation when that happens. We don't see anything. We don't feel anything necessarily. There may be some change. There better be some changes in your life. There should be some evidence of it. But still, the point is the, the uh, new birth, as we call it, being born again is an idiom that we use for what? That new creation. You are a new cre creature in Christ. You are then a son of God, a direct creation of God, no longer a son of Adam, son of God. And uh, those idioms are not just uh, figures of speech. They, they reveal a very, very profound dynamic in our, in our uh, situation. So... This whole idea of the Benai Elohim becomes very important when you get to Genesis chapter 6 because it's the reason for the flood of Noah. Why did the flood come? Because some of these angels, fallen angels, attempted to create hybrids called the Nephilim, the fallen ones. And they're embodied in all the ancient myths of all the ancient cultures. And uh, because of the contamination of the human genome, we have... Uh, uh, you, can, you can call that a form of genetic engineering if you like. Uh, God had a problem because that was why Satan did it, to try to contaminate the human race to prevent the Messiah, the Redeemer being born. And that's why God sent the flood. And if you study Genesis 6, there's plenty of materials on that. Uh, that's the, that was the ancient understanding of the ancient rabbis. It's also the understanding of the early church. Some other uh, uh, theories came up in the 5th century. They're commonly taught in seminaries today that have one, only one problem with it. They have no scriptural support. The lines of Seth issue and all that. I won't get into all that here. That's all bodied in that phrase, Son of God. And, and our confidence in our understanding of it come largely from the book of Job, some of the way these words are used. Now, there's another thing to understand from verse 6, and that is that Satan has access to heaven. God's got a, a meeting going on here, and all the angels come, including Satan. Satan's an angel. He's one of the, he, was the, he was appointed originally in charge of them all. He was, he was the anointed cherub. He's a cherubim, which is a super kind of angel. And he was the one that was in charge of all the rest. We understand from, a, from uh, Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, among other places. So he has access to heaven. The day will come, we from Scripture, when he's kicked out. He isn't kicked out yet. He has access. What does he do up there? Accuses us. He's up there as a tattletale. Boy, did you see what they did you see what he just did? Now you don't have to worry about that if in Christ, because we also have a defense counsel who happens to be the son of the, of the boss. 
And he, what does he do? What's Jesus doing today? He's up there every day interceding in prayer for you and I. Now that's a prayer partner to have. But Satan's there. He's the accuser. That's what the word really means, our adversary, our accuser. That's what the term means. That's his role. That's his nasty, vicious mission. He has both access to heaven and he has a mission that's adverse to you and I, a mission of accusation. And when you find someone that makes his living accusing the brethren, you know where that doctrine comes from. Be careful. Let's go to verse 7. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? And where have you been? Satan asked the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. Kind of interesting. The Lord says, Satan, where have you been? I've been down on the earth. I always wonder when I hear that. Is there other places you could have been to? Are there other planets you could be wandering around? I don't know. I'm not suggesting he does. I just, you know, it's interesting. Where have you been? Well, I was in the earth, wandering around, looking, checking things out. Walking up and down in it. Satan is doing that right now. Peter, in his first letter, chapter 5, verse 8, says, warns us, be sober and be vigilant because, why? Your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. He's out to get you. Chuck, you're making a boogeyman speech. Yes, I am. <laughs> Sounds like you're scared of him. But for Christ, I would be. I mean, yeah, but for Christ, I, I, I don't have to be, is what I'm trying to get across. I'm up that line a little bit. You get, I think you know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 4, Paul tells us, be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down on your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Interesting. You're upset with your wife or your wife's upset with you. Don't let the sun go down on that wrath. Why? Because it gives Satan an opportunity. Satan an opportunity. I, I'm indebted to my wife. Because often I'm very moody and I'm, 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 you don't see that side of me. I give you my best face. But she tells the real truth about it. Read her book. She'll tell you. Um, I can be awful, but she doesn't let us go to bed with a chip on her shoulder about whatever, some stupid thing that's got me off, off stick. She virtually forces us to say, wait a minute, let's straighten it up before, let's not let the sun go down on our wrath, if you want to call it that. For lots of reasons, not the least of which is we don't want to give place to the devil. That's where Satan has a field day. Anytime. Husband and wife are at odds. Satan's got an opportunity. And he'll take care of it. Take advantage of it. Praise God for my the incredible woman God has given me that really understands that. In fact, in Ephesians 6, we have an elaboration of this where Paul tells you, be, you know, be strong in the Lord. Put on the armor of God. Why? For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, and so forth, those are ranks of angels in the Greek, those terms. When we wrestle against uh, rulers of darkness, and he's not talking about our political structure, he's talking about the, the, uh, the hosts of Satan. You remember when the uh, Lord said, he, he said to Peter that uh, Satan has desired to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed not that you wouldn't, wouldn't fail, not that you wouldn't fall, but that your faith fail not. He didn't pray that Peter wouldn't fall. He prayed that his faith fail not. Interesting. Interesting to study that. Anyway, let's move on. Verse 8. The Lord said unto Satan, see, he's calling all things together. Satan said, hey, where have you been, Satan? I've been running around checking out things on the earth. The Lord says, have you, con the Lord challenges Satan. Notice the challenge does not come from Satan. The challenge comes from the Lord. He challenges Satan. Have you checked out my servant Job? You almost can see the Lord's thumb under his suspenders here. You know, this is, have you considered my servant Job? That there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and is cheweth evil. Listen, God here is endorsing Job. You want to join Job's three friends and say, well, he must have been sinning or he did this or he did that. Hey, God gives, he gives you his report card in verse 8. There is none like him on the earth. Certainly not Chuck Missler. Because Job is a perfect, upright man, one that feareth God and is true evil. None like him in the earth. Job's report card is the key to the rest of the book. If you don't really 
understand that, you'll miss most of what goes on. You'll lose the whole point of the righteousness of, if the righteousness of Job is in any way tarnished, if it is in any way blemished. Uh, it, it, the whole point of this book will lose its impact. See, don't we reap what we sow? Where justice ends, love begins. That's part of what this book is all about, as you'll see before it's all over. And Job's friends are all wrong in this point. In the discourses that occur with his three friends, these extensive, each one is going to have about three cracks at Job, and there's three friends, there's quite a few discourses. Each one is wrong. It sounds great, some tremendous arguments, they're all wrong, because they are wrong about this point. See, what makes this collision of viewpoints that make up these uh, the coming uh, uh, discourses so dramatic is the soundness of their arguments. They're cogent, but they're wrong. If they were frail arguments, they'd fall apart. This wouldn't, this wouldn't be a piece of literature. Their arguments are sound. They're real, except they're wrong. You can have very persuasive arguments that stand the test of scholarship that are still wrong. They're wrong, contrary to the Word of God. But notice, right up here, as we get going here, it's God that's challenging Satan, not the other way around. Verse 9. And then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? In other words, yeah, no wonder he's right because you just spoiled him. He's rich and he's got all this neat stuff. Take all that away from him. You know, that's, that's sort of the flavor. Now Satan's going to, you know, set up a test here, in effect. See, Satan's premise is that Job is only after his own self-interest. He worships God for his own welfare. By the way, I don't see anything wrong with that. <laughs> you know, I worship God because I'm better off doing that. I know that I am. I admit it. But see, Satan's premise is that Job's doing it only for his self-interest. And this is the ultimate question for each one of us. See, we, we, we see sa Satan's cynical um, premise uh, underlying all this. Is worship a coin that buys only, that only, you spend only for a heavenly reward? Is piety to God a contract? I do it because it's going to, you know, Will Job serve God if he gets nothing in return? That's sort of the implied question here. We're talking about real worship instead of just thanksgiving. Now the attack here that Satan is attacking will attack the integrity of God. And because uh, Satan is accusing God of rigging the rules. Rigging the rules. You know, it's astonishing to realize how many fundamental theological premises prevalent today attack the character of God. I'll give you two. Just to, I, I think with, with two, I can offend everybody. So they're probably, you know, it only takes a couple to get just about everybody here. First one is amillennialism. Most denominations, Catholic and Protestant both, are amillennial in their eschatology. Well, yes, the Lord's coming back, but he rules in our hearts. I mean, a real millennium of a thousand years, come on, get serious. They disparage the idea of a real millennium. That's what they're called amillennium. There isn't really a millennium. It's just symbolic language. It sounds good until you realize that it's making God a liar. Because all through the Old Testament, beyond little check verses, all through the Old Testament, God hammers away. 1,845 times promises, talks about the second coming of Jesus Christ coming to rule on the earth. The babe of Bethlehem is going to take the throne of David. He never has yet. The throne of David is a, a, an earthly political throne. That's what it means. Not, God's, he's not on David's throne now. He's on his father's throne. He's out of place. He's going to take David's throne. Amillennialism. It's not just a different viewpoint of prophecy. It's a fundamental concept of what the Bible is all about. God means what he says and says what he means. And throughout the Old and New Testament, he talks about this. To deny it is a way of attacking the character of God. Let me get even more offensive to some of you. Calvinism is another one. Dave Hunt, who I respect, very controversial, but I respect very highly, has got a new book coming out. Uh, I've got a manuscript. He's asked me to endorse it, which I have. I'll be, my endorsement will be on the cover. His title of the book is What Love Is This? Subtitle, Calvinism's Misrepresentation of the Character of God. Ooh, that's a debate that's going on for a lot of time. What's, what's, what's new here? 
So you don't have just two choices, Calvinism or Arminianism. Those are just two. That's the way it's been couched. No, there's much more to it than that. And David will attack that rule here. But the point is, be careful. Be careful not to attack the integrity. God means what he says and says what he means. And when you stay there, you're protected. You start wandering around in some of these, these uh, hmm, viewpoints, uh, you can get in trouble fast. I love, just uh, just this weekend, I had a wonderful, I had a guy drive six hours from Colorado Springs to come and spend a few hours on Saturday. We had a wonderful time. Uh, I won't get into more details, except he highlights something that Rademacher said. I, we both know him. He's a neat guy, neat theologian. He says, we're talking about what biblical theology is. Hopefully, that's what you and I are doing is biblical theology. What is biblical theology? That's the theology that lines between the exegesis, what the text really says, and systematic theology. <laughs> In other words, it's, it's the real, it's so often we get it, we, we systematize it, and then we impose that system on whatever we find. Okay. Now, let's set that aside. Let's, see what the, let's, let's just follow what the text says, and it'll keep us out of trouble. By the way, God is going to use Job to silence Satan. And he's, as he does this, he's also going to deepen Job's own spiritual insight, and as he does so, he'll deepen yours and mine. So, so And Job will be blessed doubly for, for enduring all of this. Any of you who have worked in a forge and so forth know that metal has no strength until it's tempered. And that's exactly what's going on here. Verse 10. <clears throat> Satan continues, sir, Hast thou not made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. You know, this is an interesting verse. There's a very fundamental theology that we can learn here, and that is that Satan can't touch you unless God permits it. Satan's complaining. No wonder Job's uh, you know, got it. He, you have, you, haven't you put a hedge about him? You protected him. You won't let me in that fence. He's, he's, he's sealed off. Can't get my hands on him. On every side. You've blessed the work of his hands. He's, his, you know, his, all his, his portfolio is up in the market. <laughs> All his ventures are prospering. No wonder he loves you. You see the implied threat there. You, you know, that Job loves God because it's profitable for him. But the key insight here is that nothing can happen to any of us unless God permits it. Everything, if you're a Christian, everything that happens in your life is father-filtered. Is father-filtered. So when you have a trial in your life, one of your prayers should be, Listen, Lord, that the lesson not be wasted. Because you don't want to go through it again <laughs> once it's set up. Yeah. Verse 11, Satan continues, Put forth thy hand now and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. That's Satan's challenge. You know, you've, got, you've, you've, you've just spoiled the young man. But put forth your hand now and touch all that he has. His possessions is in focus here. He's going to touch other things later with his possessions. And he will what? Curse thee to thy face. The very thing that uh, Job was offering, giving offerings for, for her that his sons might do, the idea of cursing God. We don't think of cursing God because that's so overt, but there's probably a thousand ways we find to curse God subtly, if nothing else, by omission, by oversight, whatever. Anyway, let's get on here. Verse 12, And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power, only upon thy himself Put not forth thine hand. In other words, God says, okay, I'll change the rules. You can touch what he has. He says, Put, behold, all that he hath, is in other words, his possessions, is in your power. Only upon himself. In other words, you can touch his belongings, his things, everything, except his person. You can't touch that. I want you to notice something. God's restrictions are never challenged. Satan is bound. He's subservient to you know, there's a, there's a, a, a guy named Koch wrote, wrote a book many years ago called Between Christ and Satan. It's a well-intended book, but the title is tragic because it implies they're equal. Christ between Christ, as if, there, as if there's a contest between Christ and Satan. No, Christ created Satan. He's the creator. No contest in the traditional sense. Only upon himself put not forth thy hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. You notice Satan didn't waste any time. He is gone like a shot. I visualize the Roadrunner cartoon. You know, he's on his way. He got his authority. He's on his way. Satan's a rebel, but he's one constrained by the rules. 
And there's no even suggestion that he attempts to break those rules. Those are not the issue. God is totally in control, even this, from cover to cover in, this book, in the book of Job, but also in the whole Bible. God is in control. Let me give, give you another example that many people overlook. The Pharisees determined to take Christ, but not on a feast day. And the Romans would have a fit because they're worried about insurrection. We're going to take him, but not on a feast day. Check the text. And one night at dinner, Jesus announces that he's going to be betrayed. That shook Judas. He wasn't ready. That wasn't the night. This was Passover. Not only is it a feast, it's the high feast of the year. You've got to be kidding. But the cat's out of the bag. Someone here is going to betray me. And all the time he said, And Satan panicked. Christ says, what you do, you do quickly. He splits. He's got to get it together. If he doesn't do it tonight, it's over because the word's out. You got a fisher gut bait guy. So he runs to make the arrangements. Notice who's in charge. And then Judas, it's Christ. He's calling the timing. You get to Gethsemane. They're there with the, they show up with the arms and so forth. He says, who's seeking? Jesus of Nazareth, I am he. And they fall down. They're so shocked. I said, who are you asking for? Jesus, well, I told you I'm he. Well, if you me you seek, let these go their way. Look who's giving the orders. To the troops. Jesus is. He controls every detail. No, God is in control in this book, from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. He's in control. Make no mistake about it. Don't ever lose sight of that. Verse 13. And there was a day, back in, now we're back on the earth. Now you notice, by the way, just remember this as we go through. Job didn't have the benefit of this conversation. The phone wasn't tapped. He didn't overhear this conversation, this, this deal going on here. He's, in, he's, he's living his life. And there was a day, verse 13, when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in, their elder, in the eldest brother's house. There came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them, and the Sabians fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Satan doesn't waste any time. Having dinner and to get a message that his whole deal is wiped out by brigands, in effect. The Sabians were a region from southwest Arabia, and uh, so on. But that, you get the, the role here, of course, is, is uh, for the adversary. Verse 16, while he was yet speaking, there came another and said, The fire of God has fallen from heaven and hath burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I only am escaped to tell them. Here's another messenger. Comes ragged, maybe with... Scars and burning, whatever. He says, let me tell you what just happened. Whew. Fire of God fell and burned up the sheep. How many sheep? 7,000 sheep? Boy, that was some fire. So we got a second messenger came, right? Verse 17. And while he was yet speaking, there came another and said, the Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels and carried them away. Yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone am uh, here to tell thee. Camels were the most prized animals in that part of the world. The Chaldeans were fierce, marauding inhabitants of Mesopotamia. Probably from the north. In contrast, the Sabians which came from the south. These came from the north, but that's just details. Pretty rough, isn't it? Verse 18, we're not through. Satan doesn't waste any time. He's got his license. Boy, he runs with it. Verse 18, while he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house and fell upon the young men, and they are dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. You think you've had a bad day? Can you try to, it's, you know, we, don't get lost in the poetry of the thing, but can you, four messengers coming probably from four different directions saying, by the way, catastrophe is falling. You're wiped out, fella. The, mar the Dow has gone to zero, you know. You have nothing. And, and by the way, your seven sons and three daughters are history. It's interesting how Satan seems to have control over natural forces. Do you remember when Jesus was on the boat on Galilee and there was a storm that was so bad 
that the disciples thought they were going to perish. Now, these disciples were not landlubbers. These were guys that were in a partnership in a fishing business on those very waters. They'd been there. They knew what was, what was, what was, what, what was all about, and they were terrified. I suggest to you that that storm in the Gospels is not a natural storm. And, I, and it's interesting, what does Jesus do? He rebukes the storm. He rebukes it. That's an interesting use of phrase. Well, we're down to verse 20. And Job arose and rent his mantle. He tore his clothes apart. That's a very Jewish thing to do. You know, tear your clothes. Job rose and rent his mantle and, and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground. And what did he do? What did he do? He worshipped. Really? Shaving the head, of course, was a, 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 a classic form of mourning uh, uh, rituals in Mesopotamia and, and Canaan. And uh, because of its heathen associations, it was forbidden by law uh, in, in, uh, in, in uh, so forth. But that was later on. You know, this is the first chapter of Job. You know, the next time you have a bad day, the next time you think you've got some bad news and you think you're kind of down, <laughs> read Job 1, read Job 1, and follow his example. He worshipped. The next time the malignancy of Satan goes to the limit, take comfort in the fact that whatever that limit is, is one that God set, and he will not set that which you can't bear. Scripture promises us that. There's far deeper significance in the book of Job, far deeper reasons for God's permission of tragedy than the ones we usually think of. I could give you a list of ten. We do that when we go through the book of Romans. Why do Christians have trial? There's ten reasons. They're all good ones. There's probably more yet. Primarily the revelation of the mercy and uh, compassion of God. It's interesting, Job, at least so far, has no complaints. C.S. Lewis made a great crack. They asked him, why should the righteous suffer? What was his answer? Why not? They're the only ones that can handle it. Isn't that neat? I love that. That's typical. That's vintage C.S. Lewis. Verse 21. Notice what Job's reaction to all this is. I think this is, naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. I don't think he means he's going to return to the womb. I think you get the guy. <laughs> naked came out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The mother here, by the way, don't, don't run with this, but implicitly is the earth. In other words, it's not his mother like coming out of the womb. In that sense, he's using the mother's womb as an idiom that he came out of dust. Dust I've come and dust I'll return. That's sort of the gist of what he's saying. Naked I came out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. What he's saying is, I recognize God's sovereign right to do with me as he will. You know, that's an easy thing to say because you can't change it if you, <laughs> if you wanted to. You know, if it's inevitable, relax. The key point is he didn't charge God with doing wrong. He didn't curse. And interestingly, he didn't even curse the mechanisms by which these troubles came. He didn't curse the desert brigands. He didn't curse the frontier guards that were supposed to protect his things. He didn't curse the architect that built the house so poorly that the house that killed all his kids. Was he upset? I have to assume he was, but he didn't charge God with wrong. His amazing response, and I submit there aren't, there's probably no one in this room that would argue they would have done as well as Job did. He did better than I would have. I would have grumbled, I can assure you. I may repent of it later, but I would have grumbled it under the mirror. That happens to me frequently, and I don't have any problems like this guy did. Job's amazing response proved that Satan was wrong. You got the picture? Satan said, if you take his stuff, he's going to curse you. He didn't. He let him take it. He didn't. See, God's, uh, uh, Satan's premise was that uh, man couldn't be godly without material gain. And here's a disproof. This man was godly apart from his material gain. Lost thereof. 
And again, this mother's womb thing in, in, in Psalm 139, Ecclesiastes 5, and Ecclesiastes 12, you'll find that idiom used just of the earth. It's a, I don't want to get into the Gaia thing. Don't misunderstand me. But uh, anyway, it really speaks of the dust of the ground, like in Genesis 2 and 3 and Job 10 and 24. We'll see more of that as we go. Verse 22. We're going to make this good. In all this, notice what the word of God says. In all this, Job sinned not, nor did he charge God foolishly. He passed the test. God was vindicated. And the question you have to think about on your way home tonight is, how would you have done? <laughs> Don't ask me. I know I would have failed it badly. See, if Satan had his way, every one of us would be in this kind of difficulty. The reason you're not is because God hasn't permitted it. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, God will not test you above that you're able to bear. What a precious commitment from the Holy Word of God to each one of us. Dr. Francis Schaeffer pointed out that the first argument of the gospel is not that Jesus died for your sins. <gasps> That's what he said. Francis Schaeffer said, I didn't say it, Francis Schaeffer said First argument of the gospel is not that Jesus died for our sins, nor that God loves us and has a wonderful plan for our lives. I'm not saying that isn't true. That's not the first principle, the first step. You know what the first argument of the gospel is? That God is there. That God is there. You can't do any of that until he's there. You understand? He, God is there. God is real. God really does have a hedge about you. God really is in control. There is a God and he is in control. You start there and all the rest builds on that. And that's what this book's all about. The book of Job. Fabulous, fabulous book. Fabulous book. Now, relax. We've gone one chapter in one evening and this is a 42 chapter book. <laughs> If this was a seminary class or something, we might go through it verse by verse all the way through and so on. But I'm not going to drag you kicking and screaming through the book of Job verse by verse, as we usually do with most of the books. We go verse by verse, chapter, chapter a week. That's been our style for 30 years. We will try to cluster somewhat. Now, for next time, we will, of course, take chapter two. But I encourage you just to read ahead a bit. And I won't try to predict exactly how far we'll get next time, but I can assure you it'll be more than just, you know, we're not going to go a chapter. We'll, we'll do, <laughs> we're going to start picking up some speed here. In a sense, there's sort of three sections, the front end, the back end. There are these, disc, there, there, then there's these discourses with the three friends. We'll go, go through those. There's a lihu. There's a strange guy that shows up. And, 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 and that's a subject of a great deal of, of, of uh, conjecture as to what that's all about. But finally, God shows up and answers the three guys for, on Job's behalf, sets their clock for them, and then gives Job a science quiz that's my favorite part of the book. And there's a conclusion and a surprise at the end. And to the, the surprise at the end, I, I especially treasure for some reasons I'll read it when we get there. But uh, the book of Job, we, we hope to... Uh, just so you can get a feeling for what we're going to be doing here, we'll be trying to do the book of Job in about eight evenings. That doesn't mean we're going to go five chapters a time. We're going to do it a little differently. But we're going to try, we'll try, try, I'm going to try. If I fail, we'll extend it a little bit, but I'm going to try to do it in eight evenings because that way it's manageable because I want to give, us, give you enough handle on it so you can plunge on your own. through. See, our ministry is based on two basic presuppositions. The first, you've heard me talk a thousand times, that this is an integrated design, 66 books penned by 40 guys over thousands of years, and yet it's an integrated message which has its origin from outside the dimensionality of time. You can prove all that. That's our basic premise in this mystery. But the second premise, and that is that you can understand it. Our premise is that you are capable of understanding the Bible on your own, not by something somebody tells you. Luke warned you, don't believe anything Chuck, in Acts 17, 11, he says, don't believe anything Chuck Missler tells you. But receive the word of, be like the Bereans, receive the word of God with all openness of mind, but search the scripture today to prove whether those things be so. You can do it for yourself. You shouldn't be dependent upon a leader. Learn from him, yes, but you, you want, your, your goal is, to, is your own direct understanding from his word. And that is 
what this is. Those are the two basic premises. 